Alrighty, so um, next up we've got uh, Tim from Cloudflare talking about uh, internet background noise. Okay, it doesn't go back. Okay, great. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Tim. Uh, it's my first time at NZNOG NOG and in Napier, so I'm really excited to be here. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about noise on the internet and sharing a story about two really, really noisy subnets. So, a quick bit about me uh, I'm not actually a network guy, I'm a solutions engineer, so I'm more of a software guy. Uh, my role day to day is I get to have the best job in the world where I get to help lots of different organizations build faster and more secure websites. If you haven't heard of Cloudflare before, it's really okay because whether or not you've heard of us, you've, you're already using us in some way. And the reason for that is because we operate a large content and ne delivery network, performance and security services for 12 million websites around the world. Uh, a few numbers about us. Uh, we, we operate in 76 countries around the world. Uh, we deliver DDoS mitigation services with our 25 terabits per second of capacity. And we're interconnected with 195 internet exchanges around the world, which is going to be an important metric about how we are able to observe all this noise and interact with it. We serve about uh, 600 billion uh, web requests every day uh, and 140 uh, DNS requests every day. So I'm going to get into talking about the history of these noisy subnets that we've got on the internet. The subnets I'm going to be focusing on today are 1.1.1.0 slash 24 and 1.0000 slash 24. Uh, let's dial back in time a bit to 2010. Uh, back in 2010, these subnets were bogon prefixes. No one was really using them, uh, but there was a lot of whispers around because everyone knew that they were very noisy and they were attracting a lot of junk traffic which is what we're going to look at today. Back in 2010, uh, APNIC wanted to get a sense of the type of junk traffic that was running on these subnets, so they worked with RIPE. Uh, RIPE uh, set up their little test lab, started advertising 1 slash 8 on their box, and they thought 10 megabits should be enough to get a sense of what's going on here. Uh, so if you look at the charts on the left, that's what happened. It was just immediately saturated. So, they needed a different approach. Uh, so the next step was working with Merit, uh, where 1 slash 8 was an, uh, announced on a much larger box. Um, and this was a box, uh, when they turned it on, they started passively uh, accepting all of the traffic. And what passively came in was about 160 megabits per second of data uh, without, without even asking for it. It was just what came straight in. They started capturing the data, and over about a two-week period, they collected about uh, eight terabits, uh, terabytes of packet captured data. So in, uh, this is back in 2010, so this is an enormous amount of data. Uh, following that, YouTube and Google worked with the ranges, uh, but ultimately, APNIC came to Cloudflare because uh, while YouTube and Google have an awesome network, and they do a lot of good stuff, uh, they needed to work with a provider that was interconnected with a lot of internet ex uh, exchanges and had a much wider lens over how the internet was performing. So we partnered. Uh, we didn't just uh, advertise them on the internet and collect data. We wanted to create value with this service. So we made the 1.1.1.1 DNS resolver. Uh, this is a free, fast, recursive DNS resolver. Everyone here is welcome to use it. Uh, it's privacy respecting. We don't log your IP address whenever you make a DNS request. You can use uh, DNS over TLS or HTTPS uh, for encryption. Uh, and you can even download an app on your phone to secure your phone's uh, DNS traffic as well. Uh, we're really proud of it. It's really fast. We're actually the fastest DNS resolver in the world. Uh, and we're automatically able to um, come in at under 15 milliseconds of response time in Oceania. So let's look at uh, what the noise and junk on 
what the noise and junk coming in is. Uh, previous studies, as we saw, we were gathering around about 100 megabits per second of data. Uh, over time, between 8 and 13 gigabits per second of data, uh, with 1 gigabit solely on 1.1.1.1, which you can see on this chart at the bottom. Let's look at what type of traffic we're going through. Uh, interestingly enough, it's mostly HTTP proxy traffic on a wide range of ports. So we have your AD443 and the miscellaneous proxy ports. And that's the majority of it, 93%. We also had a fair bit of UDP traffic. Uh, this included some DNS traffic that was already coming through even before we announced the resolver service. And the scary bit is actually syslog traffic. Uh, some of the syslog traffic was, uh, which was actually sourced from government agencies in the US. <laughs> yeah. yep. So I imagine someone just typed 1.1.1.1 in there to get past the uh, validation field. Talking about DNS, uh, we also found that there was a lot of DNS traffic coming through on 1.0.0.19. And it turns out that there's a very large uh, deployment of TP-Link devices which have hard-coded 1.0.0.19 as a DNS re uh, resolver. Uh, so you can go on Stack Overflow to fix that if you're running TP-Link at home. Most of it's uh, heavily weighted to internet populations. Uh, a lot of the traffic is coming from China, uh, which you know is really just about the, the sort of size of the populations, uh, with the remainder of it being spread between the US and the rest of the world. We found uh, there were a few bursts and patterns uh, within this traffic. Uh, in the evening, so we've got 4 p.m. UTC, which is about midnight in China, because we know it's weighted towards internet populations. We saw that the traffic would uh, increase from about 5 gigabits per second all the way up to 8 gigabits per second, and then another boost from 8 to 12 gigabits per second. It is mostly coming from China still. It's the same source networks. It's just more volume coming through from, those, from the originators. Uh, and a lot of it's port 80 as well. We did find a few short bursts coming through. Uh, we found that 1.1.1.1 would get a short burst every night at 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. for NTP, network time protocol traffic. Our expectation here is we think that it's probably a large deployment of uh, misconfigured network devices just pulling out here every night. We also got a bit of memcache traffic, which you know, it looks like it could be just some poorly configured. Uh, memcache is well known for being used as a reflective DDoS uh, target, so uh, probably people testing there. And to further reinforce that there's a lot of misconfigured network devices, we also saw a lot of DHCP traffic leaking onto the internet. Uh, a lot of it coming from Macau, so we expect there's a lot of uh, a large uh, misconfigured deployments out there. Prior to launching 1.1.1.1, we wanted to get a sense of, uh, you know, we've got all this junk traffic, what is actual 1.1.1.1 adoption going to be? So we looked at actual DNS traffic prior to launching the service, and even before that, there's, there was an enormous amount of DNS traffic coming through uh, on port 53. So it's changed. Uh, a lot of studies have been done into this. So we saw that there were studies uh, way back in 2010 and 2014. Now that we're looking at it today, uh, we're seeing that it's really growing. The, the trends aren't going down. It's definitely going up and to the right. Uh, we're seeing 10 or 20 times more traffic than in previous studies. Uh, we're still seeing the same kind of iperf traffic coming through. And ultimately, we think, uh, we estimate about uh, Thirteen percent of the traffic coming in on these subnets is actually legitimate, with the rest of it just being junk. Next, I'm going to talk about the availability. So we run a very wide network, uh, and we learn now that we're actually running a service. We're learning very quickly when one user can't access the one dot one dot one dot one as an IP address. So thanks to Atlas probes, we ran monitors all over the world. 
Uh, we found that a lot of ISPs were null routing 1.1.1.1, which made, makes sense for a very long time. It, it was just being junk data, and <coughs> it doesn't make sense to incur the cost of sending on your backhaul. Uh, but a bit more concerningly was we found that sometimes 1.1.1.1 would just stay within the network where we ran the test, and sometimes it became an FTP server. So something was installed there. As we've been running the service and we've been learning from different people who have you know, downloaded the app or set up their web browser to use 1.1.1, uh, from time to time people get to a hotel and realize that they just can't use 1.1.1.1. Uh, we, we always get in contact with them and ask them to fix it because it's, it's, we're actually using it now, so please uh, be gentle with it. And we found that more than 30 ISPs around the world uh, were having issues. A lot of them, as we mentioned, were now routing it. Uh, a lot of people also like to use 1.1.1.1 slash 30 as a point-to-point -point address. That's easy to remember, I guess. And a lot of people are also using 1.0.0.0 slash 24 as uh, internal networks and testing purposes. Uh, I think we saw in the previous talks as well, 1.1.1.1 had made an appearance in those slides too. Uh, a lot of the ISPs were really good. Uh, a lot of really good people cleaning up their configurations. Uh, but the concerning part is we've had a few non-responses, uh, and this included a large uh, cable company in the United States. Documentation, okay. Uh, put your hand up if anyone here has written, written an IP address on the whiteboard. I'm sure, I'm sure we all have. Yeah, I definitely have. And keep it up if you, keep it up if it started with a one and a dot, right? Yeah. Uh, we do it all the time at Cloudflare because we write IP addresses on whiteboards. But once we launched the 1.1.1 service, what we realized was everyone was writing 1.1.1.1 on, on a whiteboard, but thinking it was the resolver we were talking about when it was just some example. Uh, it's not the right way to do it. There's an actual standard for what IP addresses you should use in illustrations and documentation and examples. RC 5737. There are your IP addresses there, 192.0.2.0 slash 24. Please use them in your illustrations uh, because bad things can happen. Right? Uh, but I'll forgive you if you haven't done this in the past. I'm sure we've got a lot of Cisco certs in the room. If you are studying for your CCNA, <laughs> there's one more in <laughs> yeah. So that's a fictitious unsigned IP address. Um, but the thing that worries me more than that is actually 2.2.2.2. That's France Telecom's IP address. <laughs> so, yeah. Cool. Uh, a lot of people are a bit possessive about these IP addresses. Uh, I think they've been using it for a while. Uh, we got an old mate here in a forum which was using uh, 1 slash 8 for all of his network purposes for decades. And is very frustrated now that he has to share it with the rest of the internet. Uh, of course, we've already seen that TP link has had some challenges with configuring their devices before they deploy it. Uh, yeah. It's not the first time we've seen some challenges with TP-Link, actually. Uh, there was a deployment of TP-Link de devices which leveraged some universities' NTP servers uh, in China and Australia and New Zealand to uh, perform their own health checks and availability monitoring. Uh, that ended up consuming 700 megabytes per month per device, so you can imagine at scale deployed across 100,000 devices that can be very expensive very quickly. And new in 2019, things are still happening. Uh, we found 1.1.1.0/24 was accidentally hijacked earlier this month. It looks like it was just a test network or something that leaked down to the internet. Uh, that could easily be solved by using, you know, the standards. Uh, and also, we're also finding a lot of ping traffic now. So we receive 60 megabits per second of just ping 1.1.1.1 traffic every, every second, right? Okay. And my conclusions, okay. We saw that there are lots of different types of misconfiguration and misuse. Uh, the things that worry us the most at Cloudflare is there's private data coming through, syslog information from, from government agencies, DHCP data. This is not stuff that you want leaked out onto the public internet where anyone else could, could read it. 
At Cloudflare, we see private data as a liability, so we throw it all away, we don't store this. Uh, but anyone else on the network path may not be so kind. So please follow the standards, configure your network appropriately, and don't leak data onto the internet. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. So my name's Jeff Houston. I'm the sucker that, that ran 1.1.1.1 for, for many years. The reason why you're seeing so much shit from China is actually rather bizarre. What the Chinese do with their firewall is kind of some really clever shit about long-held VPN connections and some really brutal, superficial rubbish about the DNS. And the way they stop you going to Facebook is really easy. They just answer 1.1.1.1 whenever you ask for facebook.com, right? But what they don't do is then block the routing for 1.1.1.1. <laughs> so all these folk who say, I want to go to Facebook, mm. launch packets at 1.1.1.1, hence your data. Yeah. There are two things that are weird. One, they should filter the bloody stuff. Yeah. But two, why are they doing port 80, not port, port 443? That's the bizarre mm. bit about all of this. So, yeah, the other thing, too, is I think there's a certain amount of translation error mm. because most of the time in China when we test, we see Facebook is 1.1.1.1, mm. except in a couple of provinces where the instruction all ones ends up with an answer for Facebook.com of 255.255.255.255. All ones, I assume, Facebook is everywhere. Wow. Good presentation, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Is, is there a trend? Are you getting more rubbish or less rubbish over time? So the data we have at the moment is from about mid last year. So we, we know it is significantly higher since then. Um, we are working on gathering more data for a new talk uh, into 2019. Uh, but what, what I'm expecting is we'll see is, as adoption of 1.1.1.1, the DNS resolver increases and people complain about not being able to access it or something going wrong, uh, that will allow us to start cleaning up the internet and getting the ISPs to yeah. fix it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, thank you. Alrighty, thank you very much. Um, next up, we've got Jordan from Internet NZ giving us an update on Internet NZ. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, nice to be here again. Uh, nice to have a conference center with air conditioning. <laughs> Makes a nice change from last year's melting experience. Um, I'm going to give you a quick update on INZ, where we're at, what we're working on this year. Uh, it'll be brief. We'll be still even more ahead of time afterwards, unless you've got heaps of questions. Um, and some of this is a bit about just adjusting our brand following the merger of Internet NZ and NZRS last year. Um, and there's always more info than what's in the slide pack. Um, the first thing I'll start with, though, is just to um, get the colleagues here from the Internet NZ team to stand up. So if you guys are on the staff, Sebastian Castro is our chief scientist, leads our research team. Um, Daniel Griggs, one of our senior sysadmins, standing at the back and waving in the unmissable shirt. <clears throat> and Brent Carey, the domain name commissioner, is also here. He's standing over there. Um, and Yvonne and Maria are at the front um, helping with the logistics of the conference. So we're pleased to be a strong supporter of this event. It's an important community, and we will keep doing it. Um, I'll talk a bit about us, .NZ, research, commercial matters, funding, public policy, and events. Um, and you won't need to remember or write down any of the details because there aren't many to see on the slides. Um, we're working on a new sort of description of what we're about, which is helping New Zealanders harness the power of the internet. We had to take a look at that kind of thing because we had a registry company that was about excellent .NZ infrastructure. We had an internet NZ that was about the sort of woolly woof to a better world to a better internet. So try to say we're about helping people make the use of this thing. And that implies that we think that the internet can be used and should be used for good. 
doesn't mean we're ignoring the fact that there are the odd problem or difficulty that comes not from the internet but from the way people use it. Uh, and so the vision that we've got is that we're all keeping the internet open, secure, and for all New Zealanders. So there's some imperatives there around an open internet, what that means these days compared to what it might have meant 20 years ago. Uh, security, as you all know, is an ever-rising focus. Uh, and for all is about that point about inclusion, with the amount of stuff that happens online today, uh, the idea that citizens can't get access or can't afford access to the internet is a real problem. So our work is focused uh, and becoming more focused over time on those sort of three areas of work. And that's what we do. So we had a restructure last year, Internet NZ and NZS are merged into a new Internet NZ. And the Domain Name Commission has got its focus on .NZ regulation and disputes. That hopefully won't come as a mystery. You can pour over it and ask any questions you might have. Um, Running .NZ in an excellent way is our key responsibility. You know, the DNS has 20, 000, uh, 720,000 names in it in the .NZ register. Uh, the imperative of keeping that on the internet, functional, very high service quality and so on is fundamental to what we do and it's what we spend by far the largest chunk of the resources that the public pays us to do. Um, and this year we're going to be doing some work on security. It's been a while since we assessed into NZ's own threat landscape and the security resources that we have in-house. And it's been a while since we've worked with our registrars with a conscious focus on operational security. Obviously, if a large registrar gets compromised, that could spell trouble for quite a few people, and none of us want to see that happen. This is a very light once-over, in case you hadn't noticed. In terms of policy, um, the .NZ policy framework was last, uh, sort of it was reviewed and compressed a few years ago, but a kind of issues-based review of that framework hadn't been done since the current framework was established in 2002. So this year we'll be running a, an open panel-based review uh, that will take a look at sort of trying to surface, are there any issues with the way that .NZ works? And everything is on the table there. We don't think some fundamentals will change. We don't think the first past, uh, the first come, first serve type approach is likely to go. Uh, it would seem to me unlikely that national presence requirements like the Canadians, for example, have got will come into being. But there may be issues, and the point is we don't know all of them. Some of you in this room will have issues with the way .NZ operates that we don't know about. We'll be running a process to get that input from you. Um, one of the ones that's already come out from the Domain Abuse Forum that we held last year is the question of takedowns. At the moment, the Domain Name Commission has under current policy the ability to take down a domain name where uh, the registration details are incorrect. So one of the cases we started talking about in that forum in November last year is what if there's a kind of scam web shop that starts pretending it's Lotto and collecting stuff quickly. Our current policy is we won't do anything with the name unless there's a court order to do so or unless we can quickly establish that registration details are fake. That might not be quick enough given the impact and reach of the internet today, or it might be the right way to go because anything else might be the start of a slippery slope. That's one of the issues that's come up. You may have more. I'm just signaling there is a process to come to put these on the table. Um, when we did the Domain Name Abuse Forum, it was putting a difficult issue on the table for an open discussion that had around 100 people, I think, in Wellington talking this through at the end of last November. Instead of writing a long and tedious conference report about that, we hired, hired these amazing League of Live Illustrators chaps who did uh, a four diagrams like that. That's just part of one of them to try and summarize it. You can find those in a blog post on our website if you're interested in the topic and interested in seeing what was discussed. And our response to that is going to be wrapped up in changes in practice and compliance strategy at the Commission and also in the policy review. Um, in terms of what the registry is doing, we're still working on the projects list for this year. We know that um, our EPP uh, and front ends both need upgrades. The EPP was developed a number of years ago and is uh, a little bit tired. And the SRS front end is going to undergo an upgrade as well. The basic rubric at this point is um, addressing the technical debt the system faces. There's not a lot of it that still dates from the original build in 2002, but there are some aspects there. So that constant process of refresh is the focus there. Oh, too quick. Um, in terms of research, um, Seb's going to talk to you tomorrow about the um, DNS Flag Day work that he's been doing for us. Um, we released a, a sort of 
piece of Colmar Brunton research on the customer and public views about domain names um, this morning, in fact, so that's now available on our website. And one of the other research projects that um, Sebastian is collaborating with the Domain Name Commission on at the moment is sort of the fake web shops issue as an entree into wider domain name abuse research. And he has another number of other projects cooking as well. So if you're keen to hear more about the technical research agenda, um, he won't be talking about the agenda per se tomorrow, but he'll be here today and tomorrow. So feel free to have a chat with Sebastian. Um, in terms of commercial, um, a number of years ago, NZ made the principal decision that it wanted to diversify its income beyond .NZ domain name income. Um, to date, there's been a very small volume of revenue coming from new services, mainly the, um, the broadband map that we host and operate. Um, we hired a new commercial director last year, David Morrison, who's about six months in now. He's developing a new kind of pipeline approach to product and services development that's focused first on customer segments and what people might buy. Um, and that's a, a fresh and interesting approach for us. Um, one of the ones that he's working on at the moment, which I'm not sure if I meant to say, but I'm going to say it anyway, is a, um, a DNS firewall product. So if DNS firewall products are of interest to you and you'd like to hear more about that, feel free to contact David Morrison directly. His details are on our website or grab me or any of the other colleagues to talk some more about that. Um, we want to be adding value, not um, competing with other people per se in the New Zealand market, but offering new innovative services that can remain that we can fund more of the public good that we use our profits to invest in. Um, and we do spend some of that on grants funding. There's a grants funding round that's open now and it closes next Thursday, the day after Waitangi Day. So if you're interested in funding, I can't recall, sorry, whether it's a, I think it's an internet research funding round along with conference grants, uh, attendance grants, uh, you can apply for those on our website. Um, in terms of the public policy stuff we do, we keep an eye on that, the, what's going on in government from an open internet point of view. There is a review of the Copyright Act that is incredibly slowly grinding through the government policy making process. Uh, there's an issues paper out now, which is around a scintillating 100 pages or so, which you can read if you're bored and want to get more bored. Um, it's pretty heavy going. One of the topics that's canvassed in it is website blocking for copyright abuse. So the big content people, some of them, will be asking the New Zealand government to pass laws that require ISPs to block access to websites based on court orders, private lists that they share with you privately in secret behind contracts. Who knows? Um, but that will be something I think that is of interest to network operators. Um, we're pretty firmly opposed to anything in this as a matter of principle. If you are going to go down the website blocking route, at the very least you need the due process of a court making those decisions. If there's any suggestion that private lists should become the basis of ISPs blocking access to websites, we would be pretty upset. And the other one that's going to be coming eventually, possibly this calendar year, is the review of the Privacy Act, um, following the European Union's GDPR adventures last year. Reform is on the way there, so it might be something to think about. Um, last point, really, uh, the Don and Z conference, which is been traditionally aimed at registrars, but might be a bit more open. This year is coming up in Auckland on the 2nd and 3rd of May. The theme is innovation. So if you're interested in innovation in the DNS business, please think about coming along. And our annual or set biannual um, big event, NetHui, is coming in Auckland, in, not in Auckland, in Wellington, in October. So it's coming after winter. Winter is coming first. <laughs> Thank God someone laughed. At that. <laughs> That's all the topics I've got. Um, a bit of fodder there. Um, let me close again by thanking the organizers for the slot. Um, thank you for your attention and inviting you to ask any questions you might have. Cheers. I was hoping someone else might ask this, but hmm. I have to ask. All of the stuff we do in DNS for security, etc., really hinges on one essential thing, mm -hmm. that the domain name holder is accurately and consistently represented in the registry records. 
because mm. if I can fake the registry with your details and pretend to be you, you've lost it. I can fake your domain, I can create fake certificates, I can just enjoy myself. And even if it's only for half an hour, mm. as in the ether wallet theft, I only need 30 minutes of fun mm. to really cause mayhem. What are we doing and what are you doing in New Zealand about trying to make sure that when I register a domain name, my neighbour here, who is normally well-intentioned, can't assume my identity for just long enough to seize my domain for just long enough to do evil. What are we doing about this? Can, can I ask, is this about someone registering a domain with someone else's details? No, or I've registered someone, it as Jeff. Yeah, you are Jeff and you've registered but it as Jeff. My good friend, who's taken his name badge off wisely, has decided... <laughs> the secret man in the black t-shirt. ...has decided to be Jeff and right. has managed to convince the registrar by faking email, whatever, that he's Jeff for just an hour. Change the delegation details, change the DNSSEC signatures, get some Let's Encrypt certificates, because all of this can happen in seconds, and all of a sudden, he's my domain name for just long enough to do evil. How can we stop this? What are we doing about that? Because that seems to be the weak point in all of this DNS infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really good question, and thank you for asking it, Jeff. I don't have the right answer for you now, but what I, it's, it's questions like that that have motivated me wanting us to put more resources into cybersecurity, not just ourselves, but also working with the registrars. A glib answer for me would be, that is the registrar's problem and you should ask them. I don't like to be glib, and I don't think we can just say that's not our problem, talk to the registrars. Mm. Um, if there are any colleagues here who've got a, a good substantive answer on that question, you're welcome to come and make it. But I think these are some of the conversations that we haven't had in recent times with our channel to market. You know, we don't, we don't offer direct registrations to the public. We do it through that registrar and reseller network. And, you know, some things sometimes give me sleepless nights and the idea of a popular domain in New Zealand being hijacked in a, in a situation like that is one of them. So uh, it's not a great answer, but it's an answer. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Thanks. Cheers. Cool. Okay, I'll be here all week as well, so if you've got anything you want to ask not in the glare or through the pink square, feel free. <laughs> Thanks. Alrighty, so um, now we've got a, a segment about Rugby World Cup. So we've got uh, Campbell Fraser from Spark and Daryl Collins from Akamai. And then we're going to do a questions thing at the end. So we'll start with uh, Campbell, wherever he is. Oh, there he is. Very good. Good morning. Um, Lovely to be in Napier, and um, really nice for uh, NZ Nog to uh, invite us along um, to talk about Rugby World Cup. Actually, um, to talk more about Spark Sport, obviously Rugby World Cup is going to be part of that. Um, I'm going to go through reasonably quickly these slides because they're not particularly technical, um, and then I'm going to invite Daryl to come up and go through um, some of the Akamai slides. So today I'm going to talk about the, an update in terms of what content we've already looked at, timeline, technology, um, trial options, and then what moving to BAU will look like. So content announced to date. Um, you may not have seen all of this, but it has all been published out. Um, we have been reasonably aggressive since announcing that we have got the um, rights to the Rugby World Cup um, to actually get additional content, and we'll continue to do so. Um, so we have uh, EPL um, as well as Rugby World Cup, and probably one of the first uh, events that we'll be um, streaming will be the Melbourne Grand Prix, so Formula One. Um, and as you can see, hockey and uh, basketball as well, for those that are interested. Um, so the retail product, and I'm not going to be talking about anything other than the retail product right now, um, will be web browser based or um, through a native app on Apple iPhone and Android phones, um, or through Google Chromecast to begin with. Um, and also we have a roadmap for selected smart TVs where we'll have a native app on those smart TVs. Um, we haven't announced pricing uh, or packages as yet, um, so I'm not going to talk about those today either. Timeline. Pretty tight. 
think everybody will agree. Um, we will be doing a beta test um, pretty soon, next couple of weeks actually, and there are a number of people in the room that are probably going to be um, part of that. Um, we actually had a session last week with uh, some of the bigger providers. Um, and they've been invited to be part of the beta test, but only with one beta test user. Um, it's fair to say that the beta test for us is actually much more about function, not non-function. So we're not going to be doing performance testing. This is purely and simply about does the app work, does it look as if it's supposed to, um, and can we actually um, stream the content that we already have. Um, so that's going to be happening in the next couple of weeks. Um, and we'll go from beta test pretty quickly into the actual launch of the platform itself. Um, with most of the content that we have early on, so the traffic expectations aren't particularly high. Um, so we'll give everybody an opportunity to actually see what that means on the network without necessarily breaking the network for us as well, obviously. Technology. Try again. One more time. There we go. <laughs> Clicking through the slides too quickly, obviously. Um, so these are the video renditions that we'll be doing um, on the devices. Um, this is pretty much following, <coughs> excuse me, the um, standard that iStream Planet, our partner for the streaming platform, uh, use globally. So they um, use these uh, pretty much everywhere and, and they are a reasonably well respected and, and well utilized streaming platform provider. Um, so let's go on to the next one. The video renditions will be limited by device. Obviously you don't want to try and send a high rendition to a device that can't support it. So um, these slides, by the way, you should all have access to so you can go through them in any detail that you want later. It's a little bit of a convoluted path to get the traffic to everybody. Um, so the actual path will come from transmission from Japan, um, actually to TVNZ um, directly, um, and that will just be a straight stream of the data. Um, <clears throat> we will then transmit that to West Coast US, where it will go to iStream Planet. They will um, jiggle around with it somewhat, um, turning it into the different rendition streams for us, um, and then they will pass it on to Akamai. And then Akamai will start to um, publish that out to the Akamai servers in New Zealand. <coughs> Excuse me. So for um, everybody in the room, the point that you will get the content from is Akamai. Um, so if you don't know where your Akamai cache is right now, or you don't know where you're getting your content from from Akamai, that's the thing that you need to start to look at because that's the point of egress into your network is going to be via Akamai. So, um, already gone through this. Um, we are looking to have, uh, so the user authentication um, process will uh, happen within iStream Planet, so it will actually happen in the platform itself. Um, and uh, I, I guess we'll, we'll be looking at um, bit rates of between three and a half to six megs um, for HD. Um, obviously a little bit less if your device can't support it, but um, that kind of means that you have to be on either VDSL fiber or a mobile 4G connection that can actually sustain that kind of stream. Oh, what I missed off of that previous slide is we are still working with Akamai on the full architecture, um, so it's not finalized yet. So from launch, um, the World Rally, Formula One, Porsche Cup, um, and EPCR Rugby. Um, we'll also have a lot of VOD content on there as well, so that people can, so not necessarily live stream, but actual VOD content. Um, and we may see peaks of usage. What we've uh, we've spent a lot of time going and looking at other streaming providers and other geos. Um, spent a bit of time in Australia talking to Optus, as you would imagine, um, and also talking to Telstra because uh, they stream the um, AFL. Um, and uh, one of the things that has been really interesting is the um, social media effect. Um, a lot of uh, operators have talked about it, um, where people on social media actually start to talk about an exciting part of a game. Um, and you get an inrush of people actually trying to authenticate and get the content so that they can watch that exciting part of the game. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what that actually looks like and hopefully we'll have some examples of that pretty early on to see if the impact of that is, um, is as significant as some of the other operators have seen. Those are some of the things that we're starting to look at and try and figure out how we would handle that. Yeah, so we're expecting 10% um, of the Rugby World traffic but Rugby World Cup traffic will be kind of BAU once the platform's up and running. 
as I said before, it will appear as normal Akamai traffic. So part of the reason I'm doing this presentation with Akamai is to, and the Akamai guys are here, and I'd suggest you reach out to them. I'll be here um, today and tomorrow morning as well, um, if you have any questions. So augmenting Akamai's infrastructure for Rugby World Cup, it's something that um, the Spark Sport and Spark are actually uh, funding. So we are funding the augmentation of the Akamai platforms to be able to cope with the expected volumes. We are working on our 500k concurrent users. That's across all providers in the country, so not just us. Um, so we're trying to make sure that the Akamai caches are able to sustain that across the country. Um, that we think is a reasonably conservative number, but to be fair, nobody really knows. Um, there will be a certain number of the games that potentially will be free to air, so that may alter the numbers somewhat as well. Um, but again, most of that's yet to be published out. Um, uh, yeah, that's probably most of what's on there. Um, Daryl will be, I'll come up here uh, um, later and, and go through the, the Akamai portion of this, um, but uh, Dave Dickford's contacts there as well, who's the local rep, if you've got any questions. <laughs> Testing. It's the dumbest slide, I didn't write this one. Um, <laughs> why would you test them? Call. Um, so, testing is going to be interesting. As I said before, we will go through beta. And beta for us is much more about function. Um, the, the way that you would be able to simulate what's actually going to happen in Rugby World Cup is almost impossible. We spent a lot of time thinking about it. We spent a lot of time trying to come up with ways that we might be able to. I, I don't think until the actual games and some of the big games start, we won't really know what it looks like. We can model all we like, but um, testing it, I don't think is going to be practical which is why we've chosen the approach of starting to put content on there as quickly as we possibly can. And hopefully that content will give you an understanding of what it means on your network and what it starts to look like. And then you can do some extrapolation from that as to where you might find bottlenecks and where you need to augment if you need to augment. Again, and I'll stress this all the way through, figure out where your Akamai source is. That's where the traffic's going to come from. Yeah, I've mentioned already beta trial, very limited, strict confidentiality and NDA for those um, that are part of that, that probably already signed the NDA, be some operators in this room. Um, and we're not really taking a lot of feedback on it because it's much more about function for us rather than actually network performance. That's not really what we're looking to get out of the beta testing. It's much more about functional testing than it is about anything else. Um, and then the real testing will actually be the live stream, which is March. So, um, testing in production, my favourite. No. <laughs> After launch, moving to BAU. Sorry, the clicker's not winning. There we go. So, we will be setting up specific help desks. Um, we will also be uh, trying to help out with anybody that has specific routing issues or network issues. Um, I, I, it's incumbent on us to make this as, as successful as we possibly can, and that doesn't mean just our network. That actually means the entire internet to all of uh, New Zealanders. It's, it's important to us that um, we use this as an opportunity to try and um, uh, get the adoption of people having faster internet in New Zealand. It's one of the main drivers. That's why right at the very beginning of this process, we actually invited all of the main operators. We couldn't invite everybody, but we invited the main operators and also all of the LFCs. Um, to come and understand what it was that we were trying to do and to work as a guess as an industry group to try and make sure that we make this the best experience we possibly can. Um, knock to knock processes will be available for those that actually need it um, and that is going to be the larger operators but if, it, if anybody's in here and hasn't been invited to that and, and feel that they need to be, please reach out to me afterwards. I'm happy to have the conversation. Next steps. So, um, Product will launch Q1 2019. I've already gone through that. Um, RSPs need to talk to Akamai and also their LFC. Most of you for that will be chorus. Um, yeah, network testing we've already gone through and um, yeah, pre Rugby World Cup, we'll be having some uh, some integration group testing prior to. Questions. This will be the fun bit. Oh, everybody. 
Can do. Um, maybe, maybe we'll do questions after Daryl's gone through and um, yeah. Daryl and I can do questions together. Because he, he might answer some of the questions. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Daryl. Don't be shy. <laughs> Hi everyone, this is my third NZ NOG. It's great to be back seeing everyone, first time speaking. Thank you for having me. So obviously there's going to be a lot of interest in how Akamai delivers traffic because of the event. So we thought we would um, give you a presentation to give you a bit of, uh, a bit of insight into that, answer some of your questions and provide you with some contacts. So recap on Akamai. Akamai is the world's largest on-demand distributed computing platform. It consists of over or almost a um, quarter of a million servers across 1,300 networks in 130 countries and typically serves on an average day about 3 trillion requests. The Akamai CDN uh, is comprised of distinct geographically topology topograph <laughs> topologically disparate clusters. We believe that having lots of clusters in lots of places um, gives us better performance than in a few large sites. Uh, and it's important to note that in New Zealand, each cluster is effectively an island. So how does the Akamai CDN work? How do we, how do we get the traffic to your end users? So Akamai is a DNS-based CDN. That means that users querying uh, host names that use Akamai will receive different IP addresses depending on the resolver that the uh, request comes from. This is what we call the mapping. And basically for a DNS CDN, the better the mapping, the better the CDN. So when content's requested from an Akamai server, um, from Akamai, sorry, multiple criteria are looked at to work out what cluster or what server to send that request to. It could be content availability, it could be latency or packet loss, um, the cluster resources, of course, or the network utilization. And all of those vary over time. And that's why the answers that you'll get vary over time about which cluster you might be directed to. So here's an example. Uh, if we look up a fictitious host name, www.example.com, from a, a box in Auckland, uh, we get a different set of IP addresses returned than if we do the similar lookup in Christchurch. That is normal, and that's what you should expect to see. So this really complicated diagram um, is supposed to... There's a laser pointer here somewhere. Yeah. Uh, it's basically supposed to go through the DNS um, resolution process to show um, how it is that you'll get these different answers. And we have used the RFC documentation IP addresses here to avoid uh, sending more traffic to uh, unwanted destinations. <laughs> so first up, the end user request www.example.com from the ISP's resolver. The ISP's resolver recursively looks up uh, www.example.com and is referred to the, uh, the authority of Akamai uh, name server. So then the ISP's name server resolver asks the Akamai name server for the answer and the Akamai name server looks up the IP address of the DNS resolver and works out, you know, what's, what's the best place to serve users behind that DNS resolver from and replies with uh, an A record or, or a quad A record. The ISP's resolver then forwards that back to the um, end user's client and the end user issues a, a web request or whatever type of request it needs to, to, um, to get the content. So let's now delve into New Zealand specifically a little more. So Akamai's deployment in New Zealand is primarily in ISP networks uh, through Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch and a couple of the smaller cities. It also um, is present at the three IXs in Auckland, um, AKL IX, Megaports IX and APE. Now, when Akamai serves you content from Internet Exchange, what Akamai is actually doing is downloading that content over transit 
caching it and then sending it back out to the IX. The thing about IXs is, is, is we often get requests, you know, why can't you announce this other Akamai IP address range over this IX? And the answer is that it's all islands. So an Akamai cluster connected to an IX may only have a single slash 24 or a couple of slash 24s. And what you actually want is to see the DNS request returning those addresses to access that cluster rather than us announce a, a random route to you so that you can see it. But just because you only see you know, a small number of prefixes uh, from Akamai over the IX, it doesn't mean that you'll see a small amount of content. It doesn't take too many servers to fill up a 10 gig pipe these days. So why don't you get all the Akamai content over peering? Very common question. And the answer, there's a lot of different answers that all sort of form the, the overall. You know, there's no single Akamai cluster that can accommodate every type of Akamai content at the same time. The clusters get more efficient with size. So it means certain types of content only make sense to install in caches that have enough end users behind them. Some content requires specialised servers uh, and so it might only be um, present in our infrastructure clusters. Uh, some content's only uh, stored in certain geographies. And Akamai prefers on-net clusters over peering, typically. So how can you get ready for the Rugby World Cup in an Akamai context? Well, you need to think about how much traffic you're going to see. Um, you know, Campbell before spoke about 2.8 terabits. That's a lot of traffic for New Zealand, a huge amount. But how can you work out what your cut is? Event traffic typically ties in with marketing. So are your end users being marketed to? Are the matches at a time when your end users are awake and on your network? Um, are the devices that your end users are using connected to your network? You know, their set-top box might be, but their mobile phone might not be. You've got to think about those sort of things. If you have a good view of your market share, you can multiply that out by the event size. And you know, all things being equal on the previous points, that will, you know, that can give you a rough indication. But the answer here is nobody knows your end users like you do. So you can probably make the best educated guess on this one. So where will the traffic come from? Generally, you're going to see the traffic from similar locations to where you see it from today. You know, if you see it through your transit provider, you'll probably still see it through your transit provider. If you see it over peering, you'll probably still see it over peering. One way to get an indication is to do some trace routes to the host name on this slide and see where it resolves to. Now, don't just do this once. Do this over different times of day, different days of week to see if you can see a bit of a, a pattern occurring because all of this is mapped dynamically. This, this can change second to second. So you're not looking at you know, the result of one, one test. You want, to, you want to get a feel for the trend. And in terms of Akamai avoiding congesting your transit or your peering or things like that, Akamai does test um, for latency and packet loss to your DNS resolvers. So it can detect if we've congested one of your links and we will try and move that traffic elsewhere to solve that pain point. And that's a, that's a dynamic process. So what are we doing about the deployments? Uh, we're working with the existing Akamai accelerated network partners to add capacity. We're upgrading existing clusters. We're adding new clusters in existing locations. And we're adding uh, new clusters in new cities that previously didn't have enough traffic to justify it. We're also obviously adding capacity to the clusters connected to the IXs in Auckland and upgrading IX ports and so on. So peering is important if you want to get traffic over the IXs. Um, we would prefer to have bilateral BGP sessions with you. It can help maximise the um, number of ways that we can get traffic into your network. So all of our details are on PeeringDB, and we hope that yours are too, because you know, from a content provider perspective, PeeringDB is very important for, for the content providers to see what networks are where and where we might be able to send the traffic. 
So you can email peering at akamai.com if you want to request BGP sessions. So DNS resolvers. Because Akamai is a DNS mapped CDN, it's important to think about your DNS resolvers uh, and what DNS resolvers your end users are using. So if your, DN if your end users are using Google or open DNS resolvers, then Akamai gets a hint through the eDNS0 client subnet protocol about the subnet that your end user's public external IP address is in. So we can map fairly accurately based on that. Um, but if you're using your own DNS resolvers or other DNS resolvers, then we'll, all we get is the IP, external IP address of the DNS resolver. And that is what we have to use to make the decision as to where to serve your end users from. So one tip here is if you can, and I know you can't always do this, try and announce your DNS and end user prefixes to the same transits and the same peers uh, so that we don't get a mismatch there. So you can um, run this dig command um, against one of our test servers to see um, what Akamai thinks about the DNS um, server that you're coming from. So in this example here, um, NS is the unicast IP address of the resolver requesting the, um, the lookup. ECS is because we've come through a resolver that uses the eDNS client subnet protocol. ECS will um, tell us the subnet that the end user is in. In this case, 203.0.113.0 slash 24. And the IP address is the random IP address we have picked inside that slash 24 to use to check where we think the end user is located. So that's pretty much it. Um, I will be around the conference um, till the end of tomorrow. Um, there's a few contacts here. You can contact peering at akamai.com for peering sessions and mapping queries. You can contact Dave Dickford, who Campbell referred to before. Um, if you're concerned that we're not talking to you about cluster upgrades and things like that, uh, and you're welcome to reach out to me as well. Thank you. So um, we'll do, is this working? We'll do some, um, some questions now. Um, uh, I guess, yeah, um, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people who have, uh, have uh, uh, you know, a bit of complaining questions and stuff like that. And I had a totally sweet water pistol to shoot you guys with, but uh, laptops everywhere, so that's not going to happen. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're also running uh, about 30 minutes early, so lots of questions is good. <laughs> All right. So we kind of talked about that with um, Daryl before, but the big question is IPv6 support for all of that. So in the, for the Rugby World Cup and for the whole Spark uh, sport platform, um, it makes it easier for us. To, my name is Igor, by the way, and I'm from 2 degrees. Um, so we've been in that meeting and stuff, but um, it is very important, I think, not only for us, but for many others. So um, we, sorry for those that may have missed the question, it was a relating to IPv6. Um, we've had a number of queries around v6. Um, I've, uh, for each of the ones that have actually been emailed through to us, I've uh, reached out directly to those individuals. Um, I actually had a, a conversation earlier on um, today about it. Um, we will try and facilitate and find a way the, the, to, for that to, um, to function. So if we can actually get the use case um, that you're trying to solve for. Um, for some it's because they're using v6 internally and they're using CGNAT and for others it's some standards around application development. Happy to have a conversation around them and try and find ways to make it work for you that doesn't mean that you can you have to spend something unnecessarily on your network. So um, maybe take it offline if you, or, or send me details of the use case that you're actually trying to solve for. Uh, in essence though, um, uh, Akamai will be able to handle v6 requests. It depends how they get it. I mean, um, but you will, sorry. <laughs> um, what I meant is that you, you are going to enable IPv6. So, you know, like on the client side, on ECMI, you can actually, um, you, you choose basically as a customer, which is, a, um, you know, a Spark in this case, can choose if to actually use IPv6 at all or not. 
So my questions is all more like a comment saying that we do need uh, IPv6 for that to work. Otherwise, the, most of the traffic is going to go through CGNet boxes, and we don't really, you know, we don't want that to happen, basically. So, so again, I'll take it offline. But if we can talk about the use case, we'll see if we can find a way for it to work. Right? Exactly the same thing. It's the same, yeah. Uh, uh, probably is the answer. But um, inside the uh, our network, Sparks network, we we won't be using V6, so it'll be all V4. Yeah, hi. Uh, just wondering if you're planning on implementing any geo-blocking for the content? Yes. So only available? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> nice question, though. Next. <laughs> Do you next. How much of a delay will there be between the match and getting it on our screens? Like, will the rest of the world know before or after that Scotland have won the cup? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so random. Um, <laughs> there, there will be an inevitable delay between the um, live content and, uh, and, and what you see streaming. Um, we have been working on a premise that we're trying to keep that under 30 seconds. Um, how close we'll get to that 30 seconds, I, I, I don't know yet. That's part of what we'll get through the beta testing. Was there a question? Hi, uh, this is a question more about how the Akamai um, mapping works. You said that Akamai will test uh, for latency and packet loss against my resolver. What is the mechanism f for how that is done? Uh, it simply pings. Um, all of the various clusters that might be eligible to serve your end users behind your DNS resolver um, at times will reach out and ping and check how that's looking. So is um, there any... Oh, sorry. Continue. And so if your DNS resolver is not pingable, we will pick something very close to your DNS resolver to ping instead to try and get the best approximation as we can. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you spoke about availability on I iOS, iPhone, and Android. Will that include the Apple TVs and the, the Smart View devices at release? Uh, well, we're still looking at that right now, but yeah, that, that is part of the plan. Um, where it comes in that release cycle, I'm not sure yet. Do you plan to offer higher bit rates for 4K devices? Sometime this year? Um, not before Rugby World Cup. And probably not for Rugby World Cup. But the, the platform, the idea behind the platform is that it's a sports platform ongoing. Um, so it will obviously iterate. Um, and one of the things is obviously um, higher bit rates and, and being able to stream content in a much more rich way. So yeah, it'll absolutely be on the roadmaps when it comes out. Don't know yet. We're focused just now is to be able to get to the early content that we have available um, and, and make that available out on the internet. And then secondly, Rugby World Cup, and then everything else is after Rugby World Cup. Hi. Um, for transparency, I should say I was working as the Optus account manager for a major vendor. But um, I just wondered what uh, lessons they've shared with you and what you've learned from the conversations around their epic fail with the soccer. Um, I don't know that I'm allowed to talk about it, to be fair. Um, we, we did sign an NDA when we went over and had the conversation with them. Um, look, we, we've learned from lots of different operators about lots of different th problems that they've had. Um, some commonality. Uh, one of the common themes that comes through is uh, um, authentication and authentication storms. Um, so that was a big focus for us early on. Um, but there are a raft of reasons why different operators have had different problems. Um, there, there, there is some commonality, but there's also a lot of different things out there that have caused issues. So it's fairly public domain, but test on as many devices as possible would be some open feedback. Yeah, I, I, that's the other thing that we've, um, we're, we're trying to do is, uh, is actually limit the number of devices and the number early on, just to try and 
you know, it's, you, you'll have seen from the slide it's um, specific browsers and, and specific apps that we'll be publishing out, and those browsers will be pretty much version specific, so more of the later versions, not none of the early ones. Um, but we will be publishing that out pretty early as well, just to make sure that people are clear on what, what they can use and what they can't. Uh, just a question for Daryl. Um, you talk about the Akamai um, infrastructure in New Zealand. Um, you have different content from different um, capable clusters. Um, do you expect after the upgrades that you're doing that all clusters in New Zealand will be able to support the Rugby World Cup content? That's the plan, yes. Yeah, we want to maximise the locations that we can serve Rugby World Cup from. Hi, uh, um, video on demand content, is that coming from Akamai as well? Uh, yes, all, all content from the platform will come via Akamai. Yeah, and other content that needs pre-production processing, is that going via the US and then back into New Zealand? Pretty much. Yeah, so like hockey and stuff like that. Yeah, so anything, anything that's live that needs pre-production will go up via the US. Yep. yep. No other hands up at the moment? Uh, traffic routing of content to the US and back, because iStream Planet has to do its transcoding. Uh, any plans in the future to optimise that? But put a node in Auckland or something and pipe it straight through? It's a possibility we haven't looked at. But yeah, that, that, uh, I guess as the, as the platform matures, once we get past Rugby World Cup, we'll look at optimising everything that we do. So yeah, possible. No other hands up anywhere at the moment? I believe that's all the questions. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Alrighty, so um, we are 20 minutes early, not 30 minutes early now. Um, so um, now we're doing lightning talks, uh, I think at the end of tomorrow. Um, so if you have a talk you want to do, um, you know, if you could email uh, info at nznog. Talks. Sorry? Talks at nznog. Talks at nznog. Ah, they've said info. All right. Talks at nznog.org. Um, uh, and, you know, we'll you go through those, whatever. Lightning talks are normally, uh, I think, about five minutes. Um, you know, you might put one, two slides together, something like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you just email us, hey, I want to talk about this, and we'll go, yeah, you, 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 um, and then, yeah throw some slides together in a lunch break or something like that. Um, cool. What else? Can we break and head out or? We can head out early. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's, um, let's head out, uh, out that way, out to the right, and um, food will show up at some point, I expect. Thank you very much. <laughs>